welcome to Canonical. I'm James Shao, and with me are my co-hosts, Iad Daris and Sam Spieler. Yo. Yo. Don't copy my style. Yo, yo, yo. Hey, I said it first. All right, yo-yos. Today, we are concluding our discussion of Satan Tango by Laszlo Krasna Horkai, the second book in our series, Life Under Communism. If you're joining us for the first time, you can find us on Reddit and on social media at Canonical Pod. Next week, we will continue our series with a review of The Garlic Ballads by Mo Yen. We hope you'll join us for that episode as well. I think that the obvious place to start with this novel is the style. I recall, Sam, when you started reading, the first thing you said about this novel was like, wow, that's unpleasant. <laughs> I think it's worth talking about because I think a lot of people would have that reaction. One way to start is to talk about what the novel isn't, and I think it's clearly not a realist novel. But to get our bearings, if we wanted to judge the success of a realist novel as a realist novel, what would the criteria be? I think it has to speak to some level, some semblance of... I mean, for lack of a better term, realism or experience that readers in general can make out, right? Experience that they themselves have lived, or at least experiences they can imagine as realistic. Yeah, I think that that's true. I think that a big part of it is the way the characters are drawn. They have to feel true to life. They have to have a psychological realism to them. Do you think that there is anything that we could say in this novel, in Satan Tango, that requires that kind of correspondence? Does Satan Tango succeed or fail according to its correspondence with our world or with the people that we know? What do you mean by correspondence? Well, it's just like we had talked about with the realist novel. I think the realist novel if the characters don't feel like real people, doesn't succeed, right? It has to correspond with what we see in the world in people. The motto of this book, or the, what is the term, epigraph, is taken from Franz Kafka. Right from the beginning with the epigraph, a reader should understand that they're probably in for something absurdist. And at least by the time that they get to any of the scenes with the townspeople, like the clerks, we know that something is off and strange. We get this level of absurdity that feels a lot like anything that Kafka wrote, where you have this level of bureaucracy and red tape and an unpleasantness that I think even if it is more absurd than most of the things we deal with on a day-to-day basis, most of us have that experience with, say, the DMV or the post office or enter any governmental building or person that you've come in contact with. Even if it's not realistic, I think in the last episode you talked about, how did you put it, kind of taking an experience and blowing it up uh, to absurd proportions. So, sorry, Yed, are you, is your question still how are we judging the success of a realist novel? Well, we've kind of pivoted from that because I want to understand basically with this kind of novel, how do we judge if this kind of novel is successful or not? Because like Sam, a lot of people will have their first taste of Krajna Horkai and spit it out. <laughs> it leaves an immediate bad first impression. I think it strikes a lot of readers, probably maybe American readers, as weird. And a lot of readers, especially new readers, have this impression that sometimes books are weird for weird sake. (laughs) And because there is that impression, what I want to work towards is a way of understanding this kind of novel. So I might call this kind of novel the stylized novel. The most striking thing is its prose style and the construction of the whole thing from its parts, the way that it fits together as two sides. The idea I want to put forth here is that the stylized novel cannot be judged by anything external. It has to be judged internally. It can't rely on any correspondence to reality. 
Is that fair? When you say it's judged internally, do you mean how I understand, for example, that in a more experimental work, you're looking at how form matches the content and vice versa? Like, is that what you mean by being judged internally? It's just a matter of what do we as readers imagine are the rules or constraints that the writer sets before himself when he begins to write? And why does he set those rules, which could be because they match the content? And does he actually follow those rules? Because in this novel, there are things that I would say are possible rules that Krajna Horka has established. And I'm wondering if he follows those rules as steadily as perhaps he should. I think my one hang up is evaluating a work's success based on rules that it establishes itself. Like, I think that perhaps you could evaluate a novel that way, but I think there's like many different ways of evaluating novels. Like, this seems a very particular way of evaluating a novel. I'm talking about stylized novels, not like novels in general. It's it's not a straightforward process because when we try to get to these rules, getting to the rules is itself an interpretive act. Nobody is telling us these are the rules that we're going for. We have to figure it out. But if it weren't that, what would it be? I think my pushback I, against this idea of evaluating or judging it based on rules stems from the fact that it is too logical. That, you know, I don't know if art can purely be judged based on a logical system. Like, it seems like that is one way to judge art, but it seems like a very sterile, mathy way to judge art. I think that's the way a lot of people would feel. And I would admit, you know, I'm more analytical than most. So when I approach a work, I don't claim to approach it the same way that most readers would. But I don't think that my approach is not valuable because it's different from most readers. I think it's more of the way that you would approach a work, perhaps if you aim to teach it or you aim to analyze it or you aim to develop a theory of criticism rather than just appreciating it as a work of art. That said, if you're willing to go along with me and say that there are perhaps rules in Krajna Horkai's style, what are they? Because his work is distinct from other works. So what makes it distinct? What do you think he's trying to do? So is this, is what you're asking different from what we talked about earlier with the long chapters, the long sentences, the removal of context? Right, exactly that. So I think the first and obvious rule that we could say is that the sentences should be long, but not on the level of, for example, the Lime Works, Thomas Bernhard's Lime Works, where those were almost absurdly long. There are some sentences here that are quite long, but they don't reach a level of absurdity. I think on a sentence level, he's much more conventional. I think the more striking thing is his paragraphing. Yes. It's not really the sentences that overwhelm the reader. It's more the lack of paragraphing. So what is the purpose of the lack of paragraphing? I saw it as very similar to his removal of context when establishing a scene, in that if we think about what paragraphs do, they give you a logical way in and out, and they uh, section off chunks of language for you to digest. Yeah, they break up uh, subject matter and give meaning to beginnings and endings, but here we don't have a beginning or an end other than chapters. It sounds quite good, in fact, to use paragraphs. I mean, it's intuitive to write using paragraphs. So if he's not using it, why would he not use it? To what James was saying, it disorients the reader and removes that context, removes that sense of beginning or ending. So that all you are left with is a uniform continuity, 
And then what about the chapters of this novel and the way that they come to a central point and then move back outwards and how the beginning and the end of the novel parallel each other with the doctor writing the same things that happened at the beginning of the novel. Why is it structurally oriented that way? I think it kind of does the same thing. You have a beginning and an end, but they're meaningless. They are circular. You end up where you began, and you can look at what the doctor is doing as being in a point of time distinct from what happens at the beginning of the novel, but it isn't really. We're just getting a return. Like if you call the beginning A, the end of the book isn't even necessarily A prime. It's just A again. To move back from kind of talking about purpose to talking about rules, I might go so far as to say that you could not remove the chapter at the end of the novel where we have the clerks talking about Eremius's manuscript without also removing the chapter at the beginning in the first half of the novel where you have Eremius talking to the captain. I think that they exist in parallel. And if you removed one, you'd have to remove the other. This is a rule that I think Krajnohorka has established. Or if you added another one to the end, you would have to add another one to the beginning. Did you do that with the other chapters? Did you hold them up to a mirror and see how they interact with each other? Well, that I think is really the the point of this episode, the point of my inquiry is that there are rules, but he doesn't always seem to follow them. And I don't know how I feel about that. Like symmetry is beautiful and we gravitate towards symmetry, but does it need to be perfectly symmetrical? The way I understand this is if we take the example of a long sentence, A long sentence, to my mind, isn't important because it's long. It's important because of the effect a long sentence has on the reader. So a symmetrical structure isn't important in that it's symmetrical. It's important in that its symmetry has a certain effect on the reader. So this is why I was saying before where like the rules for me is not, it's not interesting for me to judge or evaluate a work based on whether it adheres to the rules because really what i think most people will judge it by is what effect those rules have on the reading experience and on the the message being conveyed i agree for most of that but i think there are books that the adherence to the rule or the break from that rule is important to the meaning. You'd have to look at the rule and at the book in particular to see why a rule is being followed for how much of the book and why it's being broken. I mean, I feel like we are talking about structuralism again. I mean, it feels like that. It feels mathy. It feels like, oh, if we do 80% of this, but we do like 20% this way, then our effect is like that, right? Like, Yeah, no, I don't mean it that way. I I guess I think I'm actually saying something similar. I think the rule is important in that if it's being followed a certain degree, when it is broken, why is it broken? What effect does that have on the reader? Yes, exactly. In the episodes that we did about Hertha Mueller's The Passport, we had brought up Sam's interest in Olipo writing. And that, I think, is a good touchstone to show how rules cannot be just kind of a mathy or nerdy way of looking at a text, but actually be foundational to the text. So, for example, George Perec has a novel, A Void. And the main idea of that novel is the letter E is not used. That is central to the novel. And you may say it's kind of a gimmick, But I would still say that the gimmick doesn't work if he says, yeah, I'm not going to use the letter E, but then he uses it just a couple times. If you say you're going to do something, or if you show the reader implicitly that you're going to do something, but then you do it occasionally, the effect is different. 
maybe not worse, but different. And then it begs the question, why have you deviated? My question then is, is it a gimmick? Because what makes it not a gimmick for me is if removing the E actually has an effect. Like if you're just removing an E to say, okay, I can write something without an E and it has no real effect, then it seems like a gimmick to me. The effect is the important part. I don't disagree that the effect is important, but I think that the effect is produced by the work. And what I'm saying is we appreciate the effect of this novel, but by looking at the way the work is constructed, we can understand even more. So let's use a more concrete example from this book, because I think what we've established is true enough that he prefers these long paragraphs, chapter-long paragraphs. In my copy of the book on page 109, there is a quite deliberate break from this. It's the chapter with SD, and it stops in the middle of a paragraph, and she says, she knew they were there, that she was facing, and then on a new line, them, and then on another line, down there. And then it goes on to another line, and then it continues with this long, almost never-ending paragraph. So what's going on? I think you could probably come up with some way to justify that and to say this is why it's happening, but is changing it worthwhile? Is this sloppiness? Is it something else? It's definitely not sloppiness. Do you think that has meaning, that break? It could have meaning. I wouldn't deny it. I think it's clearly different. It's so different from the rest of the novel that it's obviously drawing your attention to it. But it is much easier to explain the rest of the novel style. Why is it changing there? For me, I think it goes back to the religious imagery that we talked about before, that Esty is looking down on these people, maybe figuratively, but certainly, you know, what's the opposite of figurative? Literally, it's late. Where I don't think she is cognizant enough to really look down on them figuratively, but there is a suggestion in the narration that that's what's happening, that she is above them somehow, that this essence of purity that she has, or whatever you want to call it, puts her on a different plane. This is the same chapter where she talks about her expectations of heaven and about the angels knowing what she has gone through, forgiving her, and you know that they'll be soon coming to collect her and bring her wherever. I think that's possible. I don't disagree, but I would just wonder why is it that in the vast majority of the text, this kind of metaphorical meaning is not expressed textually, but here it is. And I think it could be something that could be done deliberately, a deliberate avoidance of the rule. One compelling way of thinking about this style comes from what I found in Theo Tate's review in The Guardian. Tate writes that Krajna Horkai is writing in the modernist style, and whatever gaps we find in the novel in terms of its symbolism or its style are significant in themselves. He quotes Irameus, who says in the novel, the imagination never stops working, but we're not one jot nearer to the truth. And then Tate goes on in his review to say that in Satan Tango, it feels like a horrified reaction to a world without meaning. So the novel establishes these conspicuous rule-breaking episodes specifically to show that even the novel itself confounds your imagination and your ability to figure out the style and to figure out the rules. Does that also apply, do you think, to the sections where the landlord is writing down the figures that, who knows, that people owe him? Or yeah, it's not even really clear what those numbers are. And there's also another section where um, they're hallucinating. 
and the words get combined. Oh, yeah. Right. I think that what Tate is saying makes sense to me, but I don't know if it's particularly satisfying. So you establish a prose style where it seems like things have meaning and there are rules that are being followed and things are being done deliberately, but then it doesn't work out. And sometimes it seems to have just been done incorrectly. Is it aesthetically satisfying to see a rule being broken in this way? I would say no. I think that there is an imbalance in a way because what the style does is what we referenced in a previous episode. It's like that lava that his translator is talking about. It has its own inertia and momentum in a way, which seems paradoxical, but I think it's true that it has a certain kind of inertia where when you break it, you feel like you're breaking the rule for a reason. But it's also got the momentum where you expect it to keep on going. I think that that breaking of the rule needs to be significant, but it seems to not be significant in the instances where he breaks the rules. So that makes it unsatisfying. The problem is he's trapped himself because he's writing about how things don't have meaning or significance, like that quote, right? So he's trapped himself in a way where I don't think he can satisfactorily break the rule. Another idea I want to put forth is what I'm going to call a durable style. I don't know if anybody else has talked about this before, but what I mean by a durable style is something that can be reproduced and it has an enduring appeal. We talked about realism at the beginning of the episode. Because realism has that correspondence to human life, it has an appeal. You can write as many realist novels as you want, and people will still want to read them. But when you use the text of the novel to gesture towards the inability to interpret the novel, once you successfully gesture towards that, is there anything to be gained by future novels continuing to gesture towards that? Is it durable? I feel like we discussed something like this, maybe with Bernhard, that that verges on what a gimmick is, right? That if it's truly durable, then it's not a gimmick and it's reproducible. But if he were to do the same thing in another book, it would feel to me like unless there's something else that I'm not thinking about and unless he was using the text for a completely different point. It feels like this is something you do once and then that's it. So I'm not fully following the logic here of a durable style. You're saying a durable style is one that can be reused by the writer, right? Reused by many other writers. Okay, so like in this case, it's this writing without paragraphs and uh, it's having like a structured chapter set up. Is that what you mean? I don't think it's durable then. I, th I think it would be cheap. Well, I mean, cheap, that's what I'm asking. Right? Like you're saying, is this the test? Like you're testing whether writing in long paragraphs in this structure is durable or not. Here, what I'm specifically testing is the way Tate has described this novel as something that is a horrified reaction to a world without meaning. If we create a style that confounds our interest in following rules in order to point to the fact that rules cannot be found, that seems to me like something that can only be done once. It's not durable because it doesn't bear repeating. Is the reason why it doesn't bear repeating because you're essentially just saying the same thing? Because it is to my mind, a significant thing to say, but it's not a deep thing to say. It requires some thinking to get to the point where you realize this. But once you realize this and you express it, it doesn't have any other interpretive digging possible. There's not a whole lot of nuance beyond that. Yeah. So the genius of it is the person who comes up with this first. Like, that's the genius. The application of it isn't actually that important once someone comes up with this form. I would say perhaps, yes. Like, 
another person executing a novel similar to this would not be interesting to me. But if Krajna Horkai did it first, and here I'm saying if because I don't know how original this gesture really is, it is significant. Doing it first matters with the stylized novel. I guess that's my main point. And if the novel really is the way that Tate describes it, then I would be less inclined to read more Krajna Horkai if he's going to try to do the same thing again. My response to this is a bit different because in a way it's like chess openings where people come up with chess openings, but masters and grandmasters over time come up with variants to chess openings. I mean, if you are good at chess, it's actually quite boring because you probably know how the first 20, 30 moves will go because it's solved in a way. So I think it's not that you can't use it again, this kind of form. It's more that it's incumbent on the next person to reinterpret how to use this form or structure. Because you can use it again, but come to a different conclusion. You can say, if I write a book with no paragraphs, it is not showing us, you know, the, the inability to whatever. Like, it's showing us something else. You're attributing a different interpretation or meaning to this kind of experimental form or this kind of rule breaking. So I think if you are saying the same thing, you're creating these rules for the same meaning, then yeah, I mean, it's reductive and it won't be as successful the second time because you're essentially cloning. That's always less interesting. At the same time, I could see him or someone else doing the same thing and it still feeling gimmicky, even if the meaning was something else achieved entirely, like it wasn't about futility of life. You know, I could see the possibility that it has some other meaning and it still probably wouldn't be satisfying because it would be the same form, a form that is, as we talked about before, very frustrating and visually unpleasant. Well, I mean, like Yad was saying, the point isn't really that it's pleasant, but it's that it's uh, a work of brilliance, you know, like in chess again, there's a term brilliancy when you innovate such that when people evaluate the game, they call it brilliant, right? Right. But I'm, what I'm saying is, again, if, if you are the person that did that, the, you know, the only person or the w one that people remember, great. But if someone, or even, even if Krasna Horkai did it again to a different point, I mean, he's a great writer. Maybe he can, maybe it is possible for it to have another meaning and have it be just as strong. But maybe I'm just not imaginative, but it seems like that would be very tough to do. Well, I'm saying like, for example, if a writer takes this form, but uses it to write uh, a stream of consciousness novel, like it would have a very different interpretation and they're using it for a very different purpose. And you could say that it works on a different level. You know, like you wouldn't read it and say, oh, yeah, this is like Krishna Horkai. I mean, it is, and it looks like it, but the effect will be completely different. I think what I'm hearing from both of you is that you are focusing on part of the style, but I think the part of the style that I think is most troubling is the perhaps deliberate gaps in the rule following. Like if another writer copied not only the major parts of Krajna Horkai's style, but also copied these gaps where it seems like the rules are not being followed, the first thing I would be is intrigued because I would say, why is this happening again? But then I would really struggle to imagine another reason for not following the rules other than the reason that Tate has already described, the reaction to a world without meaning. And if it is a reiteration of the world without meaning, that to me is no longer interesting. Yeah, I mean, to that I agree. I agree with you on that point. I'm saying that you could apply this structure for other meanings and that would make it interesting. So let's move on and talk about the film. 
because the film has its own kind of idiosyncratic style. It has its own noticeable style. Now, you two haven't seen it yet, but perhaps you'll be motivated to see it in the future. I think what's important to know is that it is about seven and a half hours long, black and white, and it features many long takes. Most of the takes are about 10 minutes long. Do you think that a film with that kind of style could achieve something similar to the prose style that we find in the novel? I feel like, yes, I feel like that's the obvious answer. (laughs) But I want to bring up in the review episode, we talked about how Krajna Horkai is kind of self-important. And in that interview with Paul Morton, Morton asks more or less the same question. And uh, Krajna Horkai kind of blows him off and says that that's a simplistic question. And so after he kind of blows off the question, the rest of his response is, I gave him everything, all I knew, body and soul, really everything. And despite all this, he created an absolutely original cinema, something utterly authentic, a form of art quite different from mine. And he goes on to talk quite a bit about how his work is, Krasno Horkai's work is totally different from anyone else's. And yet Tar was still able to make these films his own. And so I I guess his point is that it would be unfair to say that that's what he's doing, but I don't know. Isn't that kind of what he's doing? Well, I mean, this is not a film podcast, so I don't know if we're really equipped to judge what long takes and a seven and a half hour long runtime do to a film and the watching experience. But in my experience, they are akin. The style of the film and the style of the novel are similar to each other, but in a more superficial way than perhaps people would realize. Mm. Because I don't think that the runtime of the film or the long takes really accomplish what the novel accomplishes at all. I think what you get with a, a novel like this or a film like that is what you could call like the aesthetics of difficulty. And some people who like this kind of thing are really into like novels that have a reputation for being hard or films that have a reputation for being really long or difficult to watch, that's part of the appeal. And I think that appeal exists in both the novel and the film. Do you think that there is, this is sort of related to that, but do you think it also appeals to people who are interested in those more technical details, like the rules that you mentioned before the thing that popped into my head were um movies like what is it atonement i think has a 10 minute long sequence and people were really amazed by that and and, you know you know very action-packed 10 minute scene or there's um was a Birdman that appears to be one shot when it's actually three but even then that's still pretty technically amazing or at least proficient. Yeah. Things that are unusual or technically proficient appeal to the same sort of person. Mm. The person who, either by being an expert or being an aficionado, has seen a lot of the typical thing and is looking for something extraordinary. So, I mean, I'm harping once again on the effect here. I mean, if the effect of having no paragraphs is the difficulty... Uh, the removal of logic or of order, then the film representation, once again, we're not like film buffs or anything, but the film representation would probably, in my mind, be like a different kind of art house film, right? Where you have a lot of like, I don't know, close-up shots of someone's mouth speaking, but you don't know who's speaking, like that kind of thing. Like, wouldn't that make more sense? I suppose so. Than like a one long established shot? I think that... Perhaps the real genius is that Tar realized that he couldn't get the same effect in film, and he doesn't really try for it. I think you two and the listener 
who's brave enough to try to watch the movie will probably discover this. But a lot of what you find in the novel is totally missing from the movie. When I watched the movie, it was an entirely aesthetic experience. The story didn't matter. The characters didn't matter. It was beautifully shot. It was unique. It was just this kind of monument to filmmaking. With the novel, it's much, much more cognitive, much more analytical, much more considered. And I think it's just, it's really interesting to me that you have these two works that succeed very well, but in totally different ways. All right, we'll stop here. Thank you for listening. Once again, you can find us on social media or on Reddit at Canonical Pod. If you enjoyed this podcast, you can give us a review on Apple or whatever you use to listen to podcasts. Next week, we'll be back with a review of our next book, The Garlic Ballads by Mo Yen. Till then, happy reading. We'll talk to you soon. Mm-hmm.